A. Thank you. Okay. So um, this is really all there is to the definition. Um, a lot of times, if you're working in an algebraic setting, you want your, your algebras to be commutative, um, in which case, for this to be commutative, we want it to actually be super commutative, meaning uh, A0 is commutative, A0 commutes with A1, and then things in A1 uh, anti commute. So if you reverse their order, a minus sign appears. Um, that's only if we're talking about commutative things, though. Uh, of course, Lie algebras are highly non commutative most of the time. Um, so uh, now we want to define the super algebras. Uh, I believe these are also called like supersymmetry algebras, as Elliot was saying. Uh, I will use the term Lie super algebra because I'm going to accidentally call it that anyway if I don't. Um, so uh, I'm going to change my notation. The algebra is now going to be called this little math frac G. Uh, so if G is G0 plus G1 um, has a product uh, called the super bracket, or just the bracket, um, satisfying the following two conditions. So the first condition uh, is um, usually we have anti-symmetry of the bracket, but here we're going to be having anti-supersymmetry, which means that when we flip the order of these two elements, we might pick up a minus sign. So I'm going to write negative 1 to the power of the parity of x times the parity of y. This is defined on just the homogeneous elements, so like elements that are just in G0 or G1. Um, so what this means is that the bracket is anti-symmetric on basically everything, unless we're taking in two odd things. If we take in two odd things, then it's going to be symmetric. So the bracket on the odd part of the Lie super algebra will actually be symmetric. Um, so this is the, uh, the anti-symmetry rule. And then of course we have the Jacobi identity. Um, which will also look very familiar. Um, we have the same first term, and then we add in a negative one to the parity of x times y here. Um, and what we're seeing is this general trend of whenever we flip the order of two odd elements, a minus sign appears. Up here, we flip the order of two elements. If they are both odd, that is, if the parity of both of them is one, then we pick up a minus sign. Down here, there's no order change here, but there is an order change here. The x and the y got swapped from the original order, so a minus sign appears if both of them are odd. Um, and this is called, so if this uh, super algebra has this kind of product, it's called the super bracket, and it's called a least super algebra. So for the least super bracket, mm -hmm. is it equivalent to just say cyclic permutations sum to zero, or are there weird sign issues there too? Uh, cyclic permutations sum to zero, where whenever you would change the order of two odd elements, a minus sign appears. Okay, but like if yeah, the same sign, right? The cyclic permutations, you're not just like swapping uh, uh, elements; um, they're all so. Yes, but the, some of them may be odd, some may be even. So you have to look at what the permutation does on odd elements. I think. Okay. It's it's. I tend to like to think about um, the Jacobi identity like this is my personal preference because this kind of shows that the adjoint um, action is is legitimately like a Lie algebra action. Um, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, there's probably some minus signs that you often pick up. Uh, I often forget about them when I'm doing in my work. So. That's probably okay to forget them sometimes too. Okay, so I alluded to this before, uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about homomorphisms now. Uh, so a homomorphism uh, of super things preserves the grading. So it carries the even part to the odd part, uh, the, sorry, the even part to the even part and the odd part to the odd part. Uh, unless it doesn't, 
Um, so this is sort of the, the comment that you can sort of define two different HOM sets for a lot of things. One is in which you're just considering purely even HOMs. That's what I have up here. Uh, but if you're allowed to consider odd HOMs between vector spaces, then it might not. Um, so uh, for instance, the category of super vector spaces um, admits an inner HOM. And for this inner HOM, I'm going to write like an underline under the HOM to denote that I am not actually considering like genuine parity preserving homomorphisms, but I'm considering like uh, the super vector space of um, whose even part is the parity preserving homomorphisms and whose odd part is the parity switching homomorphisms, parity reversing. Uh, so this will be defined as. Um, W, this is the even part, and then the odd part is Han from V to the parity shift of W. Remember, I defined this this like parity change functor where we just swap the even and the odd part. Well, if we swap the even and the odd part, then an odd thing becomes an even thing in the Han set. Uh, so it emits an inner Han like this and an inner dual. Where we have a super vector space V. It's dual, we just defined to be the inner HOM uh, V to the field K viewed as a purely even uh, super vector space. Um, you can also make this into a tensor category. Uh, uh, via the tensor product. The tensor W as usual, but here the, the even part will be V0 uh, tensor W0 plus V0 ten, uh, V1 tensor W1. Um, and then the odd part of the tensor product will be V0 tensor W1 plus V1 tensor W0. So two odd things make it even, is sort of the, the moral of the story here. Um, okay, so this is probably enough of this like algebraic background. I wanted to get into the Lee super algebra stuff, um, or supersymmetry algebras, as you might call them after I stopped talking today. Um, so uh, one of the simplest examples of a Lee super algebra that you can possibly consider is a purely even Lee super algebra, wherein G1 is just zero, it's nothing, and we just have g equals g zero. Uh, in this case, it's just a Lie algebra, um, because all these minus one signs go away, we just have the standard axioms of a Lie algebra. Uh, but that's not a very exciting example of a Lie super algebra, when I see something that's like genuinely new, properly super. Um, so suppose I will erase the side of the board, and I can start writing some, some, some stuff down about that. Are there any questions in the meantime? Wherever I can just shut them out. I don't mind being interrupted. Okay. Uh, let's hope this marker is a little bit sharper than this one. Okay. Let's look at. Ooh, this one works. Any of the these markers good? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, thank you. I got a good one here, too. So I'll have that one with you. Okay. Uh, example uh, We want to consider, um, let's consider the endomorphisms. Uh, that is the, the inner endomorphisms. So where we allow endomorphisms to be, to be odd uh, of the super vector space K and N. Uh, K and N, by the way, I'm just defining to be K to the N is the even part, K to the N is the odd part. Um, so endomorphisms of K and N, uh, this is um, 
defined really could be the same thing as GL, uh, K, M, N, or equivalently just GL, M, N. So in the usual setting, we have um, one parameter here for our Lie, Lie algebra GLN. Uh, it's just n by n matrices. But here we need two parameters. One to denote the, the even dimension, one to denote the odd dimension. Uh, and I can write down what elements of this Lie super algebra look like. Uh, it's a big G, but that's fine. So it's going to be the set of these like block matrices, A, B, C, D, where we have A is in GLM, D is in GLN. So these are just things that will preserve KM, keep them all in KM. These are things that preserve KN, keep them all in KN. And then we will have B is going to be a M by N matrix. And then C is an N by N matrix. Um, so these two matrices, B and C, are going to be like kind of shifting between the even parts and the odd parts. That is, the B and the C will correspond to these like odd homomorphisms. Um, and so if we want to decompose this into its two parts, the even part and the odd part, and the even part will be where B and C are zero. And we just keep even things within the even part via A and the odd things within the odd part via D. And then the odd part will be everything else where A and D are zero. Uh, and what we'll notice here is that the even part of this least super algebra is just GLM directs on GLN. Uh, and we're over the super bracket. Why? Uh, is just how you would expect it to look, where we we just do the commutator. But as usual, when we swap the order of two odd things, we take up a minus sign. So I'm going to erase this. And I'll throw on negative one to the parity of x times parity of y, y x. And if you uh, check stuff, it turns out that makes this into a genuinely super algebra and everything works out nicely. Okay, so this is sort of like a, a nice, one of the simplest examples of like a properly super, the super algebra. Um, but uh, as usual, when we start considering Lie theory, uh, Lie algebras, we wanna start thinking about like, what are the simple, the simple objects? What do they look like? Um, can we classify them? Of course, there's this very nice result in the classical setting where we can classify simple finite dimensional uh, Lie algebras via like type A, type B, and so on. And I'm going to uh, very briefly go through the classification of the simple objects in the case of, uh, or rather, in the super setting, um, which you will see look very similar to the ordinary setting, but uh, are a little bit different in some places too. Okay, uh, so first off, I wanna uh, give the caveat that I'm not actually going to be classifying all uh, Lie super algebras, but uh, just some of them. So a Lie super algebra uh, is called classical type. Uh, if it is simple, uh, if the odd part is non-zero, so just to make sure we're not working with just purely even Lie algebras, uh, and the representation uh, of the adjoint action of G0 acting on G1, just via the super bracket, uh, is completely reducible. Now, I'm not super familiar with how the proof of this, this classification theorem goes. Um, so I don't know entirely why this, why this uh, 
criterion is required. I think it just makes things a little bit simpler. You don't get some like really unwieldy these super algebras. Um, but to now at least state the theorem, and then uh, we'll talk about um, each of the items in the classification of BF time. So a we super algebra. It might be the case that I'll just write like S something for super something. So a we super algebra uh, of classical type. Is isomorphic to one of the following. Uh, in one case, we have A and N. Uh, <laughs> you probably won't mean anything until I describe them later, but I do just want to write them all down before I get too into the details. There's BMN, CNN, and DMN. Oops, nope, there's just C, CN. Only need one parameter for that family. Uh, there are these exceptional type ones, F4 and G3. Uh, there's a family of, of deformations of this, this D family called D21 alpha. Uh, and then finally, there are these strange type ones, which uh, really have no proper analog in the ordinary setting. What does completely reducible mean? Completely reducible. Um, that means you can express it as a direct sum of irreducible representations. Why is it not like is that not true in general? For like uh, simply algebra. No, for uh, so if G zero is semi simple, then it's just true. I mean, if these are finite dimensions. Okay, yeah. So that that might just be guaranteed then. But 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 but, but is G zero always going to be semi simple? We mean? know that the lead. The, the super algebra is simple. We don't know that the actual even part is simple. Yeah, yeah but in these examples, it is, is that what? Uh, so the even part will, um, Maybe in the let's see, will be, I, I think there might be some cases in which the even part is not semi simple, but I I don't want to be like quoted on that. So I think there's a list of the okay. different positions. Uh, yeah, so um, if you want, uh, I think Katz's paper has like a good good reference on like what the even parts and stuff are. Um, I, I can actually, uh, yeah, there's, I should mention where, stuff is coming from. There is, I think in, in Elliot's email, there was reference to a paper by, by Katz. And um, I, I, I'm also using as a reference for a lot of this stuff. Uh, there's a really, really nice uh, textbook called, I think, like Mathematical Foundations of Supersymmetry by uh, Carmelli, Kasten, and Fiorezzi. Uh, so I highly recommend this reference. Uh, carried me through understanding all of this stuff to the extent that I do. So I'll be putting the references along with notes from today on the website if you want to see them later. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's let's start talking about some of these classical type least super algebras. Um, and at a certain point, I might have to not describe all of them so we can get to talking about uh, representations of least super algebras. Uh, but if you all have a preference for which to talk about more, I'd be happy to listen to popular opinion here. So let's talk about A, M, N first. Uh, you would really expect this to mirror um, A, a n in the ordinary Lie algebra setting, which of course refers to S L n plus one. Uh, in this case, the correspondence holds. So this is uh, just, uh, I guess maybe I'll write this is S L n plus one n plus one, uh, and then I will forget about this plus one, and I'll just talk about S L n n. So S L n n. Uh, as you would expect it to be, it's going to be some uh, subalgebra of GLMN that I just defined. So it's going to be matrices in GLMN uh, such that the supertrace of, we'll call this X, the supertrace of X equals zero. 
And the super trace is just defined to be the trace of A minus the trace of D. Uh, there are some, some reasons for this um, that uh, I won't get into too much, but it um, you can think about it in terms of uh, what the corresponding uh, Lee supergroup is for SLMN. It's called big SLMN. Um, and the condition for defining it, uh, it, it is based on this thing called the Berezinian, which is sort of like the super analog of the determinant. And if you uh, we algebraize it, that is like take the uh, this only X construction, then you end up seeing this this thing pops out. Um, but I won't go too much into that. But if you do want to hear more about supergroups, uh, I like supergroups, so you can talk about this after. Okay, so this uh, this Lie super algebra is simple. I have a quick question. Yeah, what's up? Is it obvious if I take like the Lee super bracket of two matrices, do they have the super trace zero? Yes. Uh, is that obvious? Maybe that can be an exercise okay. that we okay. we do during the break or something. Um, so this uh, Lee super algebra is going to be simple unless M equals N. Uh, in which case we must quotient by the identity matrix, the 2M by 2M identity matrix. Um, so AMN is SLM plus one, N plus one, uh, possibly mod the, 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 the K span of, of this if N equals N. Okay, so this is um, one example. Now let's talk about B, C, and D. So I grouped those together because they actually can all kind of be described in the same way. Um, uh, let's first talk about how we can describe them in the same way, and then I'll split them up into these three different uh, uh, classifications. So there is a least super algebra called OSP M2N. <laughs> Uh, which I will write out more in words. Um, there's matrices in GLMN uh, that preserve uh, an even non degenerate uh, supersymmetric. Consistent by linear form. So it's a lot of adjectives. Um, and what we probably notice immediately if we like the usual uh, the algebra setting is that uh, this condition for defining OSP M2N very much resembles um, the condition for defining both SP2N and SOM. Um, in that we need matrices that preserve a certain uh, symmetric or anti-symmetric bilinear form, so they generate it and stuff. Um, so sort of the two new, or the three new adjectives here are, are even, supersymmetric, and consistent. So um, in, the, in, in relation to the classical case, usually the preserves the form that's the group. Is this the Lie algebra? Oh, uh, yeah. So when I say preserve, I mean uh, leaves invariant, which um, like the adjoint action needs inside of it. Uh, yeah, so it basically means that if you um, uh, if we have a matrix like X like this, then X mm -hmm. U B plus mm -hmm. U X V equals zero, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and notice that I wrote, uh, oh, actually, maybe, yeah, so what we did here is we swapped the order of two things in a super super algebraic setting. So when we do that, we have to remember to put a minus sign here. So this is minus one to the parity of X times the parity of U. It's really convenient that this trick and like mnemonic devices always holds. Yes. Is it is it are they supposed to be matrices in GLMN or are they supposed to be matrices in GLM2N or oh. Uh, yeah, good point. This should be 2N. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. 
All right. Um, so let me define, yeah, let me uh, erase preserve then. Leaves invariant. All right, so even will just mean um, that it does not, oh shoot, what does it even mean? <laughs> uh, Probably a very obvious definition for this. Um, I think let's table this for now. I think it might just be if we forget it, it'll be fine. But if I think of why we need it later, I'll maybe mention it. Um, and so supersymmetric. Uh, now this means, um, maybe I'll just write Susie here, uh, means if I take the form of two, two elements, which as usual I assume to be homogeneous. Um, then swapping the two means we might pick up a minus sign uh, if they are both both odd. Uh, and then consistent means that if I take the even part of the vector space it's defined on and the odd part, uh, then they don't really interact with each other with respect to this bracket. So because of this consistency condition, it basically just means that we have a symmetric bilinear form on the even part, V0, and an anti-symmetric bilinear form on the odd part, uh, V1. And to me, this is sort of one of the most fascinating pieces of the theory of like simply super algebras, because this sort of allows us to combine the theories of SOM and SP2N, uh, because we, we sort of have this like, uh, anti-symmetric behavior on the odd part, symmetric behavior on the even part. Um, and you can check that if you try to define uh, a least super algebra via an anti-supersymmetric uh, bilinear form, meaning it's anti-symmetric on V0, symmetric on V1, then you end up with an isomorphic least super algebra. Okay, uh, so... Maybe I want to leave up. Hmm. You probably all have this in your notes. Let me erase that. So, uh, see that I'm running a little bit low on time. So, I might just talk a little bit more about these items in the classification and then talk about representation theory. Um, I do want to mention for OSP and 2 n uh, this is G. Then G0, the even part of this new super algebra, is just the classical SOM plus classical SP2N, as I had kind of been promising with a lot of my flowery language before. Uh, and then the I mentioned that there are these sort of three families of new super algebras, uh, BMN, CN, and DMN. Uh, these just refer to like different numbers that go into here. Uh, if you're interested, BMN is OSP 2M plus 1, 2N. Uh, CN plus 1 is OSP 2, 2N. And then DMN equals OSP 2M, 2N. Uh, here, we just need N greater than 0. Here we need m greater than or equal to two because we already have the m equals one case uh, happening here. Um, I guess everywhere we need n, everywhere we need n greater than zero, and then here we just need m greater than equal to two, and that's the only really conditions in these numbers. I, I have a maybe maybe it's just Yo, what's up? one important question. Um, you took matrices in GL, and then somehow you got this trace zero condition. Zero. So it's zero. G zero is S O M plus S P instead of O M plus. Um. Oh, maybe you want to take it in S N L. Maybe it's not. Important. No, you're you're probably right about that. Uh, this might be an S. I'm making a lot of mistakes here, so you all check me, and then you can look in the book afterwards, and then okay. it's like you're learning more this way, you know. <laughs> um, 
Okay, uh, I, I'm not actually going to define uh, the D21 alpha F and G families, but I will uh, allude to them briefly. Um, D21 alpha, uh, this depends on a parameter alpha, which is in our field, except it cannot be zero or minus one. Uh, it's just a, a deformation of uh, D21. Um, it's nine, eight dimensional, if you're interested. Uh, F4 is a 24, 16 dimensional uh, with even part uh, SL2 plus SO, <clears throat> SO7. And then G3 is 17, 14 dimensional uh, with even part SL2, direct sum uh, G2 in the standard classification. Uh, and then I, I mentioned PN and QN, but I'm not going to go into defining these. Um, these are both called like strange uh, series. Um, you'll find that some authors refer to it as like the, the queer series, which I find to be a little bit strange. I never really know if I'm welcome as a queer guy in this field, but you know, who knows? <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, that will constitute the rest of the classification here. Um, uh, any questions about, about all of these? All good, okay. Um, so G0, uh, okay, yeah, we can talk about the representations now as well. Okay, so uh, I will try to go quickly through the definition because okay, it's very similar to how it works in the usual case. So a representation uh, of G, also called a, a G module, um, is a, this is important, purely even homomorphism. Uh, row from G to G, L, and B for some super vector space uh, B. Um, so a submodule of a, or a sub representation of G is necessarily going to remain C2 graded. Um, and then uh, an irreducible representation just means there's no non-trivial uh, sub-representation. So it's all the same definitions as in the standard setting. Um, I was, I guess I'll state Schur's lemma and we'll maybe give one example and then you can adjourn for tea. Uh, Schur's lemma. Um, so this is a result that we see is a little bit different than in the standard setting. So we have a super vector space, and a super vector space, um, and rho from G to GLB, uh, an irreducible representation, which I will just call an irrep. Uh, and then I'll also write, um, just to define the set of endomorphisms of the representation um, to be endomorphisms of V uh, such that you take the uh, bracket here. It's zero for all X in G. Does this make sense? 
Yes. Okay. So both of these are are elements of a least super algebra GLB. So you take the super bracket and you get zero. Um, this is the super commutator, I guess. Um, so you're calling no. the anomorphisms of T, not the centralizer or something? Uh, that's usually how I refer to it, I think. Like you can, if you have a representation, you can consider the like endomorph, you can consider like morphisms or representations. These are morphisms from this representation to itself. Um, okay, okay. Uh, generally, it's things that like commute with, uh, with everything in there, unless I'm mistaken. Oh, so like you act by T on V, and then that will yeah. sort of give you a new rep a automorphism of the representation or something. Like that. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so basically, um, uh, more generally, if I have like representation V and representation W, um, maybe I have like row X here, I'll call this like row prime X. Um, we say that this T from B to W is a mm. morphism of representations if it commutes with all row X and row prime X like this. Um, so the statement that these, two, these things commute, assuming we have W equals V and row prime equals row, mm -hmm. is exactly the statement of the supercomputator. So, so T is, it can be even or odd? Oh, uh, yes, T can be even or odd, yeah. Um, so these are my conditions. Um, and I'll say then either so we'll have two possibilities and one of them is going to be true. The first possibility is that the endomorphisms of the representation uh, are just the K linear span of the identity map. Um, this is sort of what we see in the ordinary setting is that when you have an irreducible representation, Scherz lemma says that the only endomorphisms uh, are uh, the constant maps. Um, the other possibility is that the dimension of the even part of V equals the dimension of the odd part of V. And um, endomorphisms of row. Uh, is the k linear span of one and an additional endomorphism called A uh, for just some invertible element A of GL. So this is sort of like one of the first results you would see that is like purely super in um the theory of super representation theory and that like this this does not resemble anything we would we would normally see this this first part of course looks very familiar but second part it's like right the now. angular brackets oh um i guess i'm just taking so these are two generators of a vector space oh right. so, so a is like the quadratic like if, you, if i take a squared i get some combination of a and one um ah i suppose so yeah uh-huh um, and yeah, you're totally right. I should maybe not use these angle brackets for a vector space when I was just talking about. Um, oh, no, I guess it, I'm using square brackets for this. Yeah, so. okay. yeah that's standard. I, I just, yeah, it, if that that's the entire algebra, then it should be covered. Yeah. Um, I wonder. So I I could make a comment here that if you look at categories over vector space, linear categories, then the same is simple. You can break any object into simple objects and the endomorphism of a simple object is just the ground field C, for example. But if you go to super vector spaces, the analog allows simple objects with endomorphism algebra, in this sense, cliff one, it's a Clifford algebra. Those are exactly the corresponding line, quote unquote, spanned by that object is a line of cliff one module. So once you allow super vector spaces, you have the simple algebra C and cliff one. That's it. What you're seeing now is a simple object, then the morphism is cliff one. So that a squares to, well, if you normalize it correctly, a squares to one and is odd. That's what should happen, I expect, based on that. Thank you. John, do we need to assume k algebra equals both or something like that for this? Oh, um, k, uh, uh, k is the complex numbers if you're made, but um, you, you can probably uh, loosen your conditions a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I only ever think about things over C, so, so maybe not, 
question to answer. Okay, so we have like five minutes until the break. So uh, maybe I'll try to describe a representation. Uh, well, the rest of what I had planned was to describe two different representations, um, both of which would be irreducible. And then we would try to figure out as a little fun exercise, uh, which of these cases is satisfied by each of those. Um, so you drew like this thing for like B and W different. Yeah. I'm sure it's lemma for that case. Oh, um, there is, I think it's just a statement that there are no um, uh, homomorphisms, representations between two monotomorphic uh, simple things, but don't quote me on that. Um, is there something weird in that? I don't know. Yeah, there might be something weird happening with the odd part. Um, yeah. You might pick up some weird odd things, but, but the even part will be trivial. Do we, do we have something like a universal enveloping algebra? Yes, there is a universal enveloping super algebra of a Lie algebra. Um, there's a equivalent version of like DBW theorem and stuff like that. Um, this is all in in uh, this paper, which I had written there and have since erased. Um, you can find more about it there. Uh, we could probably have a whole seminar on, on this stuff, but I imagine we want to at some point talk about physics too. It, maybe this is a question for T, but will you tell us about the characteristic pol polynomial at some point? Um, that was not within okay. my plans, okay. but um, I can try to figure something out about that. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, no, I thought you were saying characteristic T as well. Okay. So let's look at an example. Um, we're going to take G. A Lie super algebra uh, with the even part, just one dimensional. So I'm going to write Zengel brackets like the K linear span. Uh, and then the odd part will be 2n dimensional. Um, you will often notice, at least in a lot of the algebraic oriented literature, that when we talk about super things, um, the, the even variables, the even coordinates will be written with like like Roman uh, letters. And then um, the uh, the odd coordinates and odd variables will be written with like uh, Greek letters. Um, I, I don't think Pass's paper uses that. I think it might be different in physics, but at least in mathematical supersymmetry, this is sort of the, the um, uh, notation that is more common. So we're gonna define uh, the super bracket here by saying that alpha i beta i is x uh, and all other brackets vanish. All the brackets are generators, that is. So uh, we will consider the Grassmann super algebra. Uh, lambda n. Uh, so this is going to be generated by n linearly independent odd variables. Um, so I guess I'll, uh, I'm going to abuse notation a little bit and use the same notation I was using up here for this, but we're taking these n uh, odd variables to c1 through cn, um, and if we switch their other uh, order, pick up a minus sign, um, this is just, you know, the classic exterior algebra um, in an n-dimensional vector space. Uh, and so we, we call this super algebra commutative because it commutes up to uh, when you flip two odd things, a minus sign appears. Um, and for any given parameter C in uh, K star, the field minus zero, um, we're going to define the representation uh, rho c of g acting on lambda n as follows. So rho c of alpha i, uh, this will be ddxi. Uh, rho c of beta i, this will be 
multiplying by C on C I. This is just like taking like the wedge product as in the Grassmann algebra. Um, and then rho C of X is multiplication by C. Um, so because we're out of time, I can uh, ask you this very um, nice exercise of why is this representation irreducible? Before we adjourn, Tossin. So the angle brackets there there mean two different things. Yeah, so so this is um as an algebra and this is as a vector space. Yeah, yeah. so here you can take the product of two things, here you cannot. Okay, and, and they super commute and they're all in degree one. Yes, uh yes, so, yeah, okay. Always in degree one, they super commute okay. exactly. Okay. Um so then the the even part of this is the direct sum of the zero, two, four, et cetera, graded components. Because this, this is, of course, like uh, Z graded, it then becomes Z mod two graded by just taking the mod two of the grading. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a little bit more, more plan that we can maybe continue with, unless I'll have more, more to say afterwards. But if anyone tell me why this is irreducible for the super representation. Okay. Exercise for the exercise for the break. Maybe we're a big exercise at the top so we know. Yeah, okay. Maybe I can even change this into yeah. exercise. All right. There we go. And then so, come back after the break. I'm going to stop recording. There we go. What people like to talk about supersymmetry is they just define the even part as normal old Lie algebra, and they say define the odd part as some representation of that Lie algebra. So we're going to be seeing that soon. Let's give a little bit of physical intuition. Um, so about where people actually use supersymmetric algebras in physics, and the answer is quantum field theory. So, there's lots of ways to define quantum field theory, but roughly we're going to be thinking about quantum field theory as just like a structure that you put on a map. So it deals with fields, quantum fields. On a manifold, let's just call it M, that usually has some sort of structure like a Ramanian metric or something. This is a Ramanian manifold. Um, and what do fields mean? Well, a field, we're going to talk about that as some map from the manifold into some space X. Um, usually this, you can stretch this to fit very many different sort of frameworks for quantum field theory. So we're thinking about this as like the, the space of fields, this X here. And the point is that we can decompose Symmetries. There are symmetries of this um, of this theory. Basically, ways to transform your fields in ways that preserve the things you care about. And being deliberately vague about this, but we'll see many examples of this later. This is just sort of the action sketch view. So let's take a local model. Um, local model is M is equal to R three comma one. So this is specifically a four dimensional space with an indefinite inner product. Um, this is supposed to like model our usual space time. So this is like the flat space version of this. So this is equal to R four with an inner product like that, which is where this inner product has signature plus minus minus or minus plus 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 so we have one dimension where the inner product of things is negative the other three dimensions is positive well with that okay so the idea is um we can look at sort of functions are our fields are functions from r3 comma one to x and then we can decompose the symmetries according to this map so the symmetries no. are going to split essentially as symmetries of or of the flat space of the space time that you're working on and symmetries of the target. 
Yes. Right, so QFT is not something that's so simple to find. QFT is basically a bunch of objects that you construct where sort of sort of building off of the space of maps. So specifically, I have some of these maps, um, these fields, and I can look at you know equations that these fields have to satisfy, that sort of thing. That set of equations that you're looking at is going to be the QFT, the quantum field theory. Um, but again, to actually define this precisely would be, is it very tricky. Um, in fact, many mathematicians say like it hasn't even been done yet, um, except in very specific cases. But right now we're just looking at, we're saying, okay, well, all I know about QFT is that it's built from these objects, these fields. So we can look at symmetries of the quantum field theory, which is sort of what physicists care about. Symmetric weight, um, symmetries of the quantum field theory, looking at them as symmetries of the field. This is sort of the origin of where these um, supersymmetry algebras come up with differences. Yeah, so this is infinitesimal symmetries. So in particular, the symmetries of this space are going to be the isometries, the things that preserve your inner product here. So these are going to be, it's denoted the isometry group of, in signature pre comma one. So this is the point, people call this the Poincare algebra. And then the symmetries of X are going to be some other Lie group. Um, depends on the specific model you're taking, but um, some other some other thing. So the point is that we sort of have two types of symmetries. These symmetries of the we can think think about these as internal symmetries. I have something I locally localize that space time and just changing it internally in some way, um, where the internal description is based on you know how. The map from M to X, the image of that point at that point in space. And then we have the space time symmetries, the ones that actually come from moving space. So this sort of decomposition is central to physics. Okay. So now let's actually be precise about something for once. Yeah, so these translations, um, so the Lorentz group is just, let me describe what ISO means. Um, so we define this to be the group of translations of the space and rotations around the fixed point of the space. So we can describe this, it's isomorphic to the Lie algebra of essentially rotations, semi-direct product with the Lie algebra of translations yeah, cool. Cool. Um, let's take a look at basically a supersymmetric extension of this idea um try to include supersymmetry into this so this leads us to the definition So a supersymmetry algebra to a physicist is going to be a very specific type of super Lie algebra. So it's a type of Lie super algebra where it's going to decompose as it's going to decompose into a couple parts. Okay. So the first part is going to be the super Poincare algebra, some super symmetric extension, some super symmetric algebra with the Poincare algebra here as the 
Uh, sorry, so I was going to write that. Uh, one yeah. And then this I part is going to be the supersymmetric version of the integral symmetries, the symmetries of the field that don't have to do with space time. Okay. Yes. Is that an analog of the symmetries of X there? This is exactly the analog of symmetries of X. Yeah. So let's split this up into even and odd parts. So the even part is going to be the isometries of um, Minkowski space. This is this R3, one is Minkowski space. You have the isometries of that plus the even parts of um, internal symmetries. I'm gonna read I'm gonna read I'm gonna re re say this in a different way because I realized what I was gonna say was wrong. Um let's investigate this this guy I saw. So I the supersymmetric isometry of three comma one um is going let's just call that g equals g even plus g odd. So let's look at what the even and odd parts are. Oh, yeah. So the even part is going to be given by um, the isometry of 3, 1. And the odd part is going to be given by, remember, it's given by a representation of this even part. Here's the important thing. It's specifically going to be a spin representation. Okay. How many people here are familiar with spin representations? If yeah, I just say that word. Yeah. I think we should go through this a little bit then. So the idea is that um, we can split up. So let's, let's deal with spin representations. Um, maybe I can use this for you. Okay, so let's first look at this isometry. As I said, it splits up into rotations and translations. So let's rewrite that over here. Isometry group three comma one splits up into SO three comma one direct product of translations. Um, and then we can look at the Lie algebra structure of this guy based off of the semi-direct product. So the Lie algebra between two elements of the rotations is going to be a subset of rotations. Two rotations produce a rotation. Two translations commute. And a rotation and a translation give you a translation. So this is sort of the the algebra structure of this isometry group. Cool with that? Okay, so let's look at the representations. We can classify these according to representations first off of just those that SO3 for one part. So reps of SO3, one. And funnily enough, this Lie algebra is actually isomorphic to SL2C. Everyone's favorite guy, you know, like the the, the basic one that we all study in our uh, Lie algebra labs. Very convenient. Um, and I, for one, know a, a full, complete description of all the representations of SLPC, of all the irreducible representations. Yes. Yeah, so as the algebras, if you count the dimensions of the vector space, this is six real dimensions, three complex dimensions. And I think if you actually worked out 
you know what the actual generators are. They do they are isomorphic. Yeah. So you can look at this as the underlying real Lie algebra of this complex Lie algebra. I think that's you want me to say it. Um yes. So we can call this yeah. SU2 plus SU2. Is that true? That's the real form. Okay, you're right. Sorry, sorry. What you're saying is that the compact real form of SL2C as the Lie group is SU2 cross SU2. So, I, I didn't hear what so you're saying the, the real form of the compact real form of SU2 is SU2, right? Yeah. So there is actually a represent a relationship between these groups that I'm talking about and this right here, which is not actually quite in this one. So let's, let's erase that. I'm not sure everything, but from now on, we're, but we're, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the representation of our of our rotations in the space in terms of SL2C. Okay. So, yeah. What we can do is we can use the theorem of highest weight. An irreducible representation is classified by its highest weight space. And for SL2, that looks like this. So we have zero here. We have one and a half, one, three halves, dot, 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 and so on on the other side. Okay? So every single weight of these gives us a representation. And the spin representation is defined to be the weight one half representation of S L uh, highest weight. Okay, so this is like very abstract right now. Um, and there is a very explicit description of what this spin representation looks like. But just for the sake of time, maybe we can postpone that to, to another week to talk about actual spin groups and separate algebras and all of that, because it's kind of involved to construct this thing. But suffice it to say, there is a unique representation with the lowest possible weight. It's in some sense the simplest representation of SO3, of SO3, one. Cool with that? So let's take a look. Um, this is actually interesting. Fun fact about this representation. It does not actually come from a representation of the Lie group, of the Lie group that you'd expect. So like you know, S F O two, we got it as the as the Lie algebra of our Lie group, a uh, big S O three comma one. And in fact, this representation that we're interested in does not actually come from a representation of three comma one. There is an isomorphism between representations of the Lie algebra and the simply connected Lie group, but this is not simply connected. So there are some representations of the Lie algebra that don't come from the Lie group. So to actually get it as a representation of a Lie group, we have to lift to. The simply connected cover in oh, is it in this room? Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay. So, like right now. We gotta get him hooked up and set. Okay. So wrap it up. Anyway, point is, um, a supersymmetric representation is defined as. Um, Something which splits into a super Poincare, a Poincare algebra, and some internal symmetry, and it has to act as a spin representation. And this is very limiting. So, for example, if we go over here, I thought I'd have more time, but this is all of the classifications of, of simple Lie that was described, um, that, that Eric described. And you can ask, okay, what supersymmetry algebras are actually possible? Specifically, if we look at superconformal algebras. 
where we replace ISO of three comma one, we replace SO three comma one with SO four comma two, basically the conform of it, but a little bit larger of a group of symmetries. And I can just basically ask, what are the possible super symmetric, super conformal algebras, super symmetric algebras satisfying that definition over there that have this as an intern as a symmetry? And I can just look through this list and see where are there things that contain SO4 comma two? And I can point at them. They are here, 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 and here. Except then you notice, um, actually, wait a minute, these aren't spinner representations. We can classify exactly what the representations look like on the R part for these guys, and they're not spinoral, except in this case. So that's one of them. So this is a D equal five representation. But then we also have, for example, weird um, low dimensional, what's it called, accidental isometries of these Lie algebras that give us a couple more conditions on a couple more possibilities for this. And we have, you know, this weird triality up here that gives us another, but it turns out essentially theorem that the dimension is less than or equal to six because you can literally just point at them and count all of them. And that's all the super conformal. So little application of the classification by Okay. Yes. I think is there, is there like one spin representation or like multiple? There is a single unique spin representation. What do you mean like it's spin oral? Like, 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 it is spin oral as in it, it it transforms under the spin representation for SO, SON. So this is a little weird because these aren't actually explicitly SON, but you can construct similar spin constructions for all of these groups. And like, notice like, so a vector representation is like, you know, the standard one. Um, you know, I just type SON, I use it to represent the spin. It's like kind of half of that. It's a, it's a lower dimensional representation that transforms differently. Yeah. What do you say that like all the like half wave representations or spin representations? I think, or... There is only a single spin representation yeah. for this group. Well, for SO42, there's like another. So for SO42, this also has a unique spin representation. Um, then you can talk about spin one half, so the spin four representation is what we're talking about. But general people call this they classify representations according to this, according to their spin, which is the value of that highest weight. Um, and if it's half an integer, they say it's spin one half, it's an integer, they say it's spin one, but the spin one half part is the part of the um, the one we care about, the spin representation. Yeah. There's like multiple vector representations. So these vector representations are for each of these parts. There's multiple parts of the Lie group it. So of the of the even part, and each of them give a different representation for their own part of the object. So that's the idea. Okay. I think the meeting is ending now. So thank you.